So yeah, this is another of our Communities Beyond Crisis series, um, and I'll get more into that. Uh, but this is a panel discussion about the climate crisis, about the climate crisis resiliency in the African diaspora. We have a great set of speakers for you today, and we're really looking forward to this talk. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to our interpreter, Alda, just to give a few instructions on how the interpretation module works if you, um, if you require English to Spanish interpretation. Good afternoon, everyone. The event will begin shortly. We will be providing spoken language interpretation in Spanish and we'll be providing the details as to how to join in a moment. Buenas tardes. El evento va a comenzar en breve. Eh, va a ser, se va a ofrecer interpretación de inglés a español a través del módulo de interpretación de Zoom. Voy a dar las instrucciones en un momento. Se encenderá el módulo y se le pedirá a todos los participantes que de alguna forma con el pulgar al, a pantalla o con el pulgar a um, Con el icono del pulgar, por favor, indiquen que están escuchando la interpretación. Bueno, cuando se habilite el módulo, van a ver un icono adicional. Si están en una computadora, va a ser un mapa mundi que va, aparecerá a mano derecha del de menú de Zoom. Si están en una tableta o teléfono móvil, va a ser en el menú More, Más o los tres puntos. Van a hacer clic ahí y van a ver una opción que dice interpretación de idiomas o language interpretation. Al hacer clic una vez más, van a seleccionar español o Spanish. Uh, en, por favor, de nuevo, se les recuerda dar un pulgar al aire para indicar que están escuchando la interpretación y así poder comenzar el evento. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Alda. Um, and so I'm going to turn on the interpretation now for anyone that needs it. Um, so let me do that now. Okay. Um, and now I'd like to introduce, um, let's see, I'm going to introduce the co director of the Tishman Center, uh, Ana Baptista, to give some remarks uh, for before we start the event. Thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, amazing event, Climate Crisis Resiliency in the African Diaspora. Uh, my name is Ana Isabel Baptista, and I am a co-director uh, for the Tishman Center. And we're very honored today to be able to co-host this event, um, which is really uh, an ongoing partnership with um, the uh, our colleagues at the Pratt Institute, uh, Professor Juan Camilo Osorio and Professor Leonardo Figueroa Helen uh, from the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Program here at the Tishman Center at the New School. Um, and this is uh, part of the ongoing series that they started in collaboration uh, called Communities Beyond Crisis. Um, so in, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Tishman Center, we are a university-wide center here at the New School University. And our mission is really to try to um, integrate design and policy and social justice approaches to tackle the climate crisis and really help advance environmental justice. Um, and we try to serve as a hub for supporting movement building and, and climate and environmental justice research. Um, and, and this mission calls us to consider uh, very much the topics of today's conversation, these intersecting and convergent crises of climate change, inequality, and racism around the world. Um, and this particular event um, brings an important focus on the impacts of the climate crisis on the people of African descent across the globe, and in particular, the topics of diasporic solidarity and how, how we, we move together um, in the face of these multiple crises, which is, of course, of critical importance as the urgency, uh, the pace, and the impacts of climate change bear down on communities across the globe. Um, Solidarity is a form of a lifeline amidst this destruction. Um, you know, and I was reminded by uh, Paul Ferrer, it's his anniversary, 
um, was being celebrated and, and he talks a lot about the radical posture of solidarity and reminds us that true solidarity uh, is found only in the plentitude in the act of love in its existentiality and in its praxis. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, I wanna, I wanna thank first and foremost, our esteemed guest speakers for um, sharing with us so generously as an act of love really um, in today's discussion uh, around this, these issues. And also acknowledge uh, the amazing leadership of our center's associate director, Mike Harrington for moderating and helping to organize the event and all of the amazing staff behind the scenes um, who have worked diligently uh, to bring this event to us today. And I encourage all of you to um, check out more events uh, that are upcoming that the center features on our website, uh, tishmancenter.org, um, and hope to be in community with all of you in many more occasions. So thank you again for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike to get the program started. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you for your leadership at the center um, and being a great mentor uh, to me as well. Uh, so now I am going to pass it over to uh, one of our colleagues at the Institute on Race and Political Economy, Grieve Chelwa, uh, to give some remarks. Um, and he's been a great help in pulling this event together. So Grieve, um, yeah, feel free to chime in. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mike, and uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, those who've spoken before me. Uh, I apologize for uh, coming into this slightly late. Uh, it's a testament of the climate crisis that we're facing. I'm speaking to you in, from Lusaka, Zambia, where we've been having rolling blackouts, sometimes unexpected. We just had one just, be, just a couple of minutes to the hour, so I was scrounging to get some electricity to sort of get onto this call. Um, certainly it's a unique honor and, and privilege for me to represent uh, the Institute on Race and Political Economy and to uh, make some introdu introductory remarks. Uh, my name is Grieve Chelwa. I'm the Director of Research at the Institute on Race and Political Economy. I should be in New York City and I will be shortly. Uh, uh, the COVID crisis delayed my, uh, my moving to, to New York City. Uh, as you know, the Institute on Race and Political Economy was uh, founded by uh, Professor Derek Hamilton. Uh, the leading e economist who who works whose work is has been quite foundational in the area of thinking about group based uh, outcomes. Uh, the institute started officially on the first of January this year, uh, and basically we are a bunch of economists who think quite carefully about group based stratifications, be they be, be they race, gender, sexual orientation, immigrant status. Um, nationality and so on. So we use this lens of stratification to understand that sometimes society, often society is organized hierarchically across groups and certain dominant groups may do deprive those who are subaltern uh, a full participation in, 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 the, in economics and in the political life of societies. So that's exactly our orientation. So our orientation is to really think carefully about economic outcomes and map those out outcomes, not on the basis of individuals, but on the basis of groups and understanding that groups set often weaponized stratifications, be they gender, be they race, uh, be their sexual orientation, be their immigrant status in, push, in pushing forward certain agendas. And I think we believe that this stratification framework is particularly important in thinking about issues of climate justice as they interrelate with racial justice, with gender justice and so on and so forth. So we're certainly very much, um, we're very honored to be uh, co-sponsoring this event. And it's only been a pleasure working with Mike um, and others in trying to get this event going. Uh, so with those few remarks, I will hand it back to Mike, and I wish you all a very, very uh, spirited uh, conversation. And I certainly look forward to much more collaborations between the Tishman Center and the Institute on Race and Political Economy. Thank you so much, Mike, for making us a part of this event. Thank you so much, Grieve. And uh, yeah, we, we could not have had this event without your help. So I really appreciate um, you being able to help us with this. Uh, so I wanted to get a little housekeeping out of the way. Um, so we do want this to be sort of a quite interactive uh, event. So, but we also want to make sure that it's um, safe and that we're not interrupting others. So if you're able, to, if you could you please put your um, 
video on uh, turn off your video and please mute yourself if you are not speaking. Although we, there may be a chance at the end, uh, if you'd like to ask a panelist a question that you could unmute yourself. Uh, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We, we really wanna hear your questions that we really wanna hear your thoughts for our discussion later. We're planning to have quite a, quite a um, good discussion. So if you are able to uh, just make sure that you put your questions in the chat and then we'll, we'll make sure to check them uh, toward the end. Um, and thank you, Sophia, for, for putting that in the um, chat. So I wanted to give some remarks and then we will get to our first speaker because um, I know that's what you all are here for. So this is our first, uh, this is our first Climbing uh, Week event. And I'd like to thank some of the people that we've worked with. Um, and this is also our fifth Communities Beyond Crisis event. And thanks to Communities, Communities Beyond Crisis, the partnership between the Tishman Center. Um, this event specifically is also working with the Institute on Race and Political Economy um, and the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Program uh, at the New School. Um, the Pratt Graduate Center for Planning and Environment and the Pratt Disaster Resilience Network. Uh, and this, the Community Beyond Crisis series builds on uh, a class that Professor Juan Camilo Osorio teaches called Planning for Disaster Crisis Movements in the City, uh, and that's at Pratt. Um, and this event in the series is focused on the climate crisis and resiliency across the African diaspora. Uh, we only have a limited amount of time, um, and I'm sure we all have a lot of Zoom fatigue in general, so we couldn't really make this a truly exhaustive uh, panel uh, that like goes across the entire diaspora, but, I, um, but we did aim to have some sort of regional diversity across uh, people of African descent. Um, and so we have speakers today from Botswana, Colombia, and the United States. Uh, that will be talking about their experiences with the climate crisis and resiliency. Um, as with all of our events in this series, we want to we don't want to focus on like the pain and loss of disasters, but we do want to talk about how we strengthen our communities uh, and foster solidarity among people. Uh, and I am glad to share time with all of these incredible speakers uh, and with all of you. So without any more delays, I want to welcome our first panelist, uh, Colette Pichon Battle of the Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. Um, so Colette Pichon Battle Esquire is a generational native of Value Liberty, Louisiana. And she's the founder and executive director of the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. She develops programming focused on equitable disaster recovery, global migration, community economic development, climate justice, and energy democracy. Um, and under Colette's leadership, uh, the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy co-chairs the National Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus with Policy Link, serves on the steering committee of the Ocean Justice Forum, uh, anchors the five-state multi-issue Gulf South for a Green New Deal. Uh, she also leads the Red, Black, and Green New Deal, um, the National Climate Initiative for the Movement for Black Lives. So welcome, Colette, and um, yeah, we're, we're happy to hear your remarks. Thank you so much, Mike, and my deep and sincere gratitude to everyone who is responsible for making this program. I'm just excited just listening to who I get to sit with today um, from Botswana and from Colombia. Just respect for um, connecting this diaspora and the conversation. Um, I also just wanna say um, gratitude to um, the new school. Um, this is a partnership we've been building uh, for a little while now. So thank y'all for caring about the Gulf South um, and gratitude to interpretation. Um, thank you for being inclusive um, and thank you to our interpreter. Uh, for her great work. Um, I am calling y'all from Slidell, Louisiana today. I just made it back into my home yesterday after Hurricane Ida um, hit the Gulf South on August 29th, which um, was ironically, eerily ironic um, that that was the 16th year to the date of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and we saw um, another big storm hit the Gulf South, um, which we define as the five states at the bottom of the U.S. that touch the Gulf of Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. And we've identified our role, um, our reality on the front lines of um, a lot of climate um, impacts in the U.S. And, um, you know, we got it again. Um, Texas just 
got it after us and uh, our communities are um, once again, uh, just faced with uh, deep recovery, um, connecting the dots, really trying to figure out what is happening. Um, for many of you, you know that the Gulf South is not new to um, hurricanes. I grew up with them. Um, when you grow up in uh, the Gulf Coast, you learn that these storms are part of our, our daily reality, uh, our seasonal um, reality. This is part of our culture. We, we do things, we know things because they, there have always been storms. Um, but these storms are different. Um, for the last 16 years, we've seen a change in that tropical, uh, those, those predictable tropical storms uh, that we know we're gonna get, except now they're bigger, they're moving faster, they're more extreme. And Ida was um, a great example of the shifts we're seeing in just the weather patterns. Um, for most of you, you know that uh, Ida, which hit in August, was preceded by the two hottest months on record, um, on record, uh, which should not surprise you, therefore, that we were seeing really warm temperatures in the Gulf, um, in our oceans. And so when the water is warm and the storms are coming, uh, it makes for this, the, the storms to increase in intensity. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I went to bed one night when the hurricane was a two um, and uh, woke up the next morning and it skipped going to a category three and jumped to a category four. I'd never seen that before in my life. You can usually watch the development of these storms and watch them get stronger, but they were getting stronger by the moment. And um, this one came ashore at a four with some places in South Louisiana clocking it um, at a category five. Um, and if you think about Katrina 16 years ago, when it came ashore, it was a three. Um, so that's how strong this storm was. Um, I took a walk this morning. Um, and you know, just offered my prayers and energy to the many large trees that have been uprooted, to the blue tarps that we can see all across our um, community uh, because the houses have been ripped through and um, we did not even get the worst of it. Um, so I send my honor and gratitude and, and love and energy to the indigenous, indigenous nations that are on the coast um, of South Louisiana and still feeling the effects as well as some maroon communities of black folks who were um, creating a space for themselves after emancipation um, into a, a safe place, um, but are now on the front lines um, of, of these storms that hit no matter which direction they go. If I think about what it is to build community after these storms, I mean, it, it requires me to just acknowledge that there are some things that are being invisibilized. Um, one, that um, the, the social networks that many people need because of poverty and because of the reality, um, these social networks are absolutely disrupted and dismantled by displacement. Um, and so when you're poor and you depend on your neighbors to help with your children or help with your groceries or help with those little things, um, disaster and displacement really break down um, what money can't buy um, or what people with money must buy. Um, but with people who have been living without those financial resources, but with a wealth of community have been able to rely on. These climate disasters are breaking that apart. I think the other thing that has been invisibilized is really the, the, um, the economic challenges that are faced just to get out of harm's way. I mean, the requirement of dollars just to get out of the path of the storm is something that most people don't contemplate. And like Katrina, this storm hit where many people were supposed to be getting their paychecks to go to another month, right? So folks who are already on the economic um, limits um, and, and, and struggling are now being hit by climate disasters with no nothing in their bank account, no, you know, nothing coming. And then the banks go down, the grocery stores go down, the gas stations go down, everything goes down. And how are you supposed to survive if our economic system is such that wages don't allow for people to save? They certainly don't allow people to save up for disaster and to be able to get out of harm's way um, or recover requires a, a whole rethinking, revamping of our economic system and, and how we even view um, labor and wages and things like that. I think the other part that is um, being invisibilized is the racialized impact of these storms. In the United States, uh, where the majority of Black people live, 
based on a legacy of slavery is also the same place geographically where we see the lowest household incomes um, and the poorest people. And it's no coincidence that in the same region where we see the lowest income and the poorest people, we see the highest numbers of black folks. And that's really the part where it's time to, to start connecting some dots. It's not race or class. It's class because of race or uh, what, what your race can tell you about all of the, all of the outcomes that you're um, really gonna have to hold and then go through climate disaster with, right? So if you're black and in the South, your health outcomes without a climate disaster are pretty bad. You put that on top of a climate disaster and we've got ourselves a double or a triple hit um, just because of our blackness and just because of the, the legacy of the South and the legacy of this nation and what, ha what has been allowed to occur in the South and to black people. And I think finally, I'll just mention that um, there's a piece of this that is um, uh, really, really sad for me, which is the recovery and watching how much of our federal dollars, how much of the donations, how much of the work goes into an, a recovery that is rooted in American consumption, rooted in American greed and, and taking and extraction. You watch um, the disrespect um, of the earth in the cleanup, in the recovery, even in just getting people their basic needs. And you realize we are using public dollars to pay into the system that builds more, um, builds more of the problem and accelerates the climate crisis. And so I'll just give you an example you know, what it is to watch pallets of plastic water bottles come in in a place where people need water and how our own federal government and, and even all of these folks who are, recover, who are responding to disaster have not yet connected the dots between the fossil fuel industry that creates the plastics, the plastics that never biodegrade and, and, and help to accelerate this problem, creating not just ocean waste and land waste, but also toxic waste just in their production how our dollars in the aftermath of disaster go to fuel that very industry and that very production and how the consumption patterns of the United States impact the globe, include, including how we consume energy from fossil fuels um, and, and just so that we can be comfortable. Um, I'm just saying this because um, these are the invisible pieces of the climate crisis that we have to begin to start addressing. This is the part of the work especially as we're thinking about Black communities in, in the climate crisis, and especially in this country of the United States, we have to start thinking not just about how we respond with a charitable lens, but instead how we um, rethink and reimagine a recovery response and even a planning process that doesn't just help our people, but helps to mitigate some of the negative impacts we're having around the planet. We're not connecting the dots. We're just doing the things that Americans always do. We're thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about the moment right in front of us and we're not really paying attention to the ripple effects that this is having. But I'll just bring it back to the trees for a minute and say some of the big trees are down, the biggest ones, in a place that is old, um, in, in, a, in communities that have been here for a long time. The strongest pieces of these communities are falling down in these climate disasters. And I think it is a sign it's not just a metaphor, it's a sign that um, if we don't do something about this soon, if we don't hold our government accountable, not just for the chaos that we are causing around the planet with our trade deals, with our uh, policies that are impacting other countries, but also if we have, to, we have to hold our government accountable to the dollars, the public dollars, that we're actually giving to the industries that are accelerating this crisis, including this infrastructure package that's about to go. They're currently right, right in this moment, we don't have a US government that is paying attention to the climate crisis. Yeah. It's, people, yeah. it's, it's people or what's, hap what's happening in the Gulf or what's okay. happening around then the Then I'm planet. not gonna, I'll leave that to you. So I'll stop there. Sorry I think someone's that. telling me to, to jump off. So I'll, yeah. I'll uh, that was um, the end of my remarks. Oh. I think that's it. oh, okay. Yep. Okay, great. I'll hand it back over to you, Mike. Thank you. Sorry about that, Colette. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a reminder for everyone to keep your microphone muted uh, while the, uh, you know, if you're not speaking, but thank you. Thank you, that, Colette. That was, yeah, that was amazing. And, and thank you for sharing that. 
Um, and on behalf of yeah, your fellow American whose family's from the South, um, yeah, I really appreciated that. Thank you. Uh, so for our next, uh, our next remarks are gonna come from Pato uh, Kelesitsi. I hope I said that correctly. Um, and Pato is the founder of Sustain 267 and the host of the, the Sustain 267 podcast. She's an advocate for sustainable African development, climate justice, and gender equity uh, with a demonstrated history dedicated to their advancement. Uh, Kelesitsi is a member of the Global Shapers community. Uh, is it Gaborone? Is that how you say it, Gabor? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Gaborone <laughs> Hub, a World Economic Forum Youth Initiative and serves as the Climate and Environment Steering Committee Southern Africa Regional Lead. She is a climate reality leader, uh, trained in 2018, and is currently pursuing her Master's of Arts and Development Studies at the University of Botswana. So thank you, Pato, for um, joining us. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna pass over to you, thanks. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Mike. Um, thank you so much to everyone who put this together, and thank you for the invitation. Um, um, and definitely, Colette, we need we definitely need action, and we need more accountability. Um, so, my introductory remarks. Um, I'm going to talk a lot around communicating climate change within the African context because that's what I mostly work on. Um, and I'm going to pose a couple of questions that should um, get you thinking just around climate change in Africa um, and the situation we have at hand. So. I believe that we can't solve a problem if we don't know it exists. And in Africa, we see the problem. We live it. Um, homes are flooded. We're losing livestock and crops to drought. Um, there's human and wildlife conflict. Um, and it's affecting us. But there's a disconnect between climate change and it, its effects. There's like a breakdown in communication between those two. And a lot of that is because a lot of information that's available to us here is from the global north. And we mistake that to be our story. We mistake it to be um, our what we are experiencing. When we switch on the TV, because we, we consume quite a bit of international media here, you hear about the recent floods in New York, you hear about the recent floods in Germany, we hear about the individual stories of like Susan in Massachusetts and how that affected her. But what we don't hear about is the flood in Maidengwe in um, the south of Botswana that washed away Kushata's house or um, how in Lamu in Kenya, people are losing their homes because of the encroaching sea. Um, so the Global North is, I'm sure you know this by now, the Global North is contributing the most to climate change um, in terms of emissions, but the Global South and Sub-Saharan Africa specifically will be the worst affected. Africa contributes around three to five percent of, of emissions, so definitely the conversation in an area that only contributes three to five percent of emissions globally versus um, countries that produce significantly more should be different. Um, currently in the global north um, and just globally, the conversation is going solar, um, what you call it, in, uh, electrical cars. But when we then bring that to Africa, what does that mean to Africa? Because we're having to pay the price for this. When we talk about having to use all these batteries for solar, what does that mean for child miners of cobalt in the DRC? When we talk about carbon sinks and rolling forests of carbon sinks, a lot of the times we're talking about in Africa. Um, currently, which, which then um, in Africa is translating to land grabs, it's translating to people being displaced from their ancestral homes to and then being relocated to areas that are barely habitable, which is why they are available to be relocated to in the first place. Um, it means urban migration, which is a whole new pot of worms on its own. Um, and these are stories that you don't hear because we're not telling our own stories as Africans. Um, the last time you, wrote, you read about, you read a climate story about Africa, who, was, who wrote it? On what platform did you consume it? What were they saying? Um, we have a situation here where we're you being used for motivation without our stories actually being told. 
So once again, the whole thing of voice for the voiceless. Um, are Africans experiencing climate change and um, Africans with climate solutions and Africans who have to live with climate change every day, are they voiceless or they're just not extended the platform for their voices? I'll share something interesting with you. Recently, there was a list by Reuters that was released um, of the top 1,000 scientists. I mean, the, the, um, the what you call this? The way that they went about putting that list, um, you know, they'll say we were looking at this, citations and the like. But what I found interesting, on the top 1,000 climate scientists globally, only five of them were African. And of those five Africans, all five of them were white, older men. But there are thousands of papers written on climate change in Africa. Who is writing them? Um, I think Grief also, Grief Trello, who spoke just now, they've also got a similar challenge um, in, um, in the economics field or in the development field. So Sub-Saharan Africa as the region which is predicted to be the worst affected, um, while the global north needs to significantly cut its emissions, um, we need to focus on adaptation and building resilience. Um, how do we how do we withstand the floods that are coming? The floods that are already here. If you look at the damage that was done by Cyclone Idai um, in in Mozambique two two three years ago, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of that damage you can still see. It hasn't been fixed. Um, when floods hit us, we are so terribly affected because our resilience to these extreme weather events is so low. So um, when the Global North talks about reducing um, emissions and then they talk about Africa not investing in emission, I mean, talk about Africa also going carbon neutral. I think it's worth noting, I came across this earlier, that 50, not 58, sorry, 48 African countries combined are responsible for less than 1% of cumulative carbon dioxide. So when, when the Global North talks about um, going carbon neutral and Africa as well having to go carbon neutral and that being a fix all solution globally, we need to bring, so we need to take some of those numbers into consideration. We need to change the conversation about climate change in Africa, about climate action in Africa um, right now, there's a big push for climate, what um, the just the just transition, which will be very important for Africa. How do we, as we move towards reducing our emissions, how do we do it in such a way that also does not sacrifice the people? How do we do it in a way that's just to the people of Africa, to the people of Botswana, to the people of South Africa, to the people of DRC? Um, how do we, yes, we must transition, but it must also be just. We should not be sacrificing African lives and African people because we want to transition. Um, when we talk about carbon neutral by 2050, um, to give you an idea, if Africa was to achieve that by, um, well, maybe not carbon neutral, but if Africa was to completely remove all its emissions today, if we were to have no emissions from, from Africa, there would still be 95 to 97% emissions in the world. So is, really, is that really the conversation that we should be focusing on as Africa? The, appro the global approach to um, the response to climate when it comes to Africa has been very paternalistic. If you look at um, some of the bodies that are availing the funding that goes towards um, recovering from or addressing the climate crisis. Africans are told what they can and cannot do. We're told you can't invest in XYZ, you can invest in XYZ. Um, and then the very same thing that we're told not to invest in, a Canadian company like Recon Africa is going to go to the Okavango Delta, please look this up, um, the Okavango Delta, and they are going to um, frack for oil. The Okavango Delta is one of the most pristine landscapes in the whole world. It's got the UNESCO heritage site status, but a Canadian company is looking at fracking there for oil. What will this mean for, I mean, yes, Af yes, Botswana is allowing it, 
However, we also need to, um, if we're being honest, there's not a balance of power between the two. Um, Canada is a G20 country. Botswana, not so much. So with, with the point that I'm making here is that the approach to addressing climate change when it comes to Africa from the global north has been very paternalistic, telling us what to do and you know what's good for the go goose isn't necessarily good, good for the gander. So um, now coming to communicating climate change in Africa, because this is another thing um, for us to start to address it, for us to really start to put pressure on our politicians to stop making the deals like Recon Africa. Um, we need to know what it means. What does climate change mean? And not just scientifically, what does climate change mean in a language I can understand? Um, and in, as a lay person who's not a scientist, what does it mean to my friends? What does it mean to my parents? What does it mean to my uncle who is a farmer? What does it mean to people in the village of my Dengue, um, in the in the south, in the northern part of Botswana? What does it mean to the, um, what does it mean to everyone in Africa? And what can we do to address it because we know it's affecting us? Um, and that's the conversation we need to be having in Africa. Um, I think that's my 10 minutes up. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Pato, and thank you for sharing that. That was, yeah, that was amazing. And thank you for bringing up that study that you told us about. I remember when you when you mentioned it, I was like, "What? Wow, that's, yeah. I, I also was like, yeah, how do you figure out who the best scientist is? That That's also a good question. But um, no, I, I really, yeah, I really appreciate that. And yeah, we, I definitely um, have some things that I, I hope we can talk about in the, in the conversation that we'll have after. But yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Um, and hopefully I can be on the podcast one day as well. Uh, so we would like to go to our um, next panelist, um, uh, Luis Gilberto Murillo. Uh, and uh, he is a well-known an influential uh, public policy expert. He has more than 30 years of experience and achievements. Uh, Murillo uh, has served in key positions in the public sector in Colombia and the NGO sector in the US. Uh, he was elected governor of the predominantly Afro-Colombian Afro state of Chocho and under President Santos administration, he served as presidential advisor and director for the Todos Somos Pacifico Development Plan and later as Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development. Um, Murillo was a central figure in leading the formulation and implementation of the National Climate Change Policy Framework under the Paris Agreement, the National Climate Change Management Law, the National Carbon Tax, and the community-oriented voluntary carbon market during his tenure as the Colombian Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development. So I would like to um, welcome, welcome you to this conversation and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you very much, really. This, uh, this has been very interesting and fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, it, it is an honor to be here because this panel is very important. What I hear from Colette and, uh, yeah, is, is very impressive and, and Colette, uh, receive our solidarity from uh, all our people, people from Colombia, from Latin America, uh, Black people, Afro-descendants that are facing similar situation. And, and thank you for sharing uh, the challenges that you at this moment have with, with, with our people, our sister and brothers there. Uh, I already have learned a lot from, from, uh, where, from the presentation that Colette and Pato made. And I relate to them is people in the Pacific coast of Colombia, in Chocó, for example, and in Buenaventura are facing similar challenges that uh, Colette mentioned, or our sister and brothers in Cartagena or in San Andres in Colombia, just to mention Colombia and not the entire Afro-descendant belt of the Americas, as I call it. Uh, and also, here in Tupato is the invisibility and how we have no voice or very little voice and how we can have platform for people to know what is happening to our 
communities. And that's the situation that we face also in Latin America and particularly in, in Colombia. I'm very glad, Mike, that this uh, climate with event is focused on the impact of the climate crisis on people of African descent across the globe because it's, it's a conversation that is not happening in the halls of powers that are making decisions that are affecting us uh, disproportionately negative. And also, there is no doubt that we need to uh, continue building solidarity between the people of the African diaspora in order to build resilient communities. Nobody will build that resiliency for, uh, uh, for us and taking into the account the history of injustices against our people, the wrongdoings of the past, the uh, dispossession that we have been facing. And I'm telling this uh, uh, with the experience of being in, in both sides as a policymaker and also as an activist. I, I really want to express gratitude to, to the Tishman Environment and, uh, and Design Center for this, this event and the other organization, and also uh, recognize what Professor Ana Isabel Batista and Professor Griff Shelwa said. Uh, and and, and that's, that's very important that in the academia also we have this conversation with, with our people, uh, uh, with people that have our, our, our own experience. And, and also let me highlight the leadership of my good friend and fellow Colombian Professor Juan Camilo Sorio that have been really in the forefront of this, of this conversation. Uh, we at the MIT Environmental Solution Initiative are working in creating platform for the for Afro, Afro descending people in the Americas and particularly in Latin America to have a voice that can be heard. And that's very important. And Pato mentioned that we need more platforms. We need more platforms to hear obviously uh, what our people have to say. And also we need to accelerate solutions to the challenges that our people are facing but co-producing models with them. There is some kind of arrogance in terms of what are the solutions available for our communities. Our communities, and Coletta said that, have been responding to these challenges by themselves. And they have models that were created uh, based on our traditional knowledge. And we need to co-produce this model with our communities to empower them, not with the arrogance that we have the solution with the technological solution. No, working with our communities. And this is what we are, we are uh, um, um, planning to do and we are implementing part of it in something that we call, and it's an initiative that we call the environmental equity and racial justice in the Amazon and the Afro-descendant natural belt of the Americas. It's a strategy for local environmental engagement and regional and global awareness for policymakers. While we are doing this, just for you to have an indicator, 80% of the, of the Amazon population is black, is Afro-descendant. But you don't hear much about the Amazon and black people and the environmental and the climate solutions and environmental solution and solution to the loss of biodiversity. And that's, and that's something that, that confirmed the invisibility that we are in. And also, you don't hear much about this tremendous Afro-descendant belt in the Americas that have communities that have very particular relationship with the natural environment. That, that have been harmonic, that have been protecting this environmental wealth, this natural wealth, this ecosystem that are strategic for any climate solution, for any solution to the crisis of 
uh, uh, biodiversity loss. So, so these ecosystems that have been managed well by our communities are providing services that are not being compensated. So the changing paradigm, as Coletta mentioned, is an imperative as is necessary. And that includes the changing of the concept of value because environmental conservation is a cultural activity, it's a cultural act. And that relationship of Afro-descending communities from South America to the South of the United States in, in, in forest ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem, and in coastal and marine ecosystem are the same. So Afro-descending communities, uh, uh, the first point that I would like to, to make and, and coming back to that is obviously have been mentioned here. Uh, it is evident that the effect of climate change represent an even greater threat to our communities. In the entire African diaspora, and particularly in the case that I know, the Black communities in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we are trapped in this invisibility that people don't know the, the tragedy that we are facing. And in addition to that, this is a crisis, not only the climate crisis, and it's a crisis that have multiple uh, uh, manifestations, the COVID-19 pandemic, public health crisis, the extreme socioeconomic inequality, the increased violence, migration, that is in relation to climate, as in relation to the lack of opportunities, and is in relation to violence. And all of this is based on something that there is a denial uh, in terms of responding to this phenomenon of the structural racism. All these mother crises have disproportionate effect on our communities. And it's based on this fact that people uh, don't want to address directly. My second point that I, I wanted to make very quickly is that Latin America and the Caribbean have a unique position to, the, to respond to these challenges, unique. Because, uh, and this is the case for the African continent, is because we have tremendous wealth. 80%, 80% of the global biodiversity is located in indigenous and local communities. And in the case of the Western Hemisphere, in Afro-descendant and indigenous communities territories. And it's the case in Africa for the Congo Basin, for example. But at the same time, these communities are facing a situation of not recognition of the services that they are providing and the, the, the goods that they are providing to humanity, and at the same time living in extreme condition of poverty and exclusion, exclusion and discrimination. So my, my third point is that in this context, in the case of, of the Western Hemisphere, and particularly in the case of Latin America, Afro-descending communities, Black communities are central, central, not, not an add-on, are central to any effective response to the climate and biodiversity loss crisis. And we are not being even heard, and we have much to say. And to really understand this and to really put these communities in the center of the discussion, put them in the center of the debate, it is necessary to have a profound change, change in paradigm. It is an imperative, it's necessary. We need to reimagine the way we interact. And in this new paradigm, Obviously, in the Western Hemisphere, Afro-descendant communities are central. 
but we will not get to the centrality of the discussion and the effective action if still this situation of enormous injustice will, will be maintained. The wrongdoing of the past and what is happening now need to be addressed sincerely need to be addressed in an effective way to have really an open conversation to take actions with us, not excluding us. And in this regard, any paradigm need to have the framework of environmental justice, climate justice, part of what was mentioned, but was mentioned uh, just transition, you need to have those frameworks and to have those difficult, difficult conversations, but it is not happening. Even if you take the four of people that are discussing and making decisions on climate change and environment, you don't see us. I, was, I had the opportunity to, to uh, define policies in Colombia from like, like being insider. And most of the time I was the only afro descender or black person in the room. And with little understanding of our experience and perspective. So my invitation uh, finally is to build bridges of connection, exchanges, and solidarity between our communities. And we need more conversation like this, more conversation like this, and connecting each other. Because we, we have a common history with some different emphasis, but for sure we have a common destiny. And what we see now, although we never, we never lose the hope, but what we see now is uh, very frustrating. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Luis, and uh, thank you for those great remarks. And um, yeah, I think uh, we're gonna have everyone on now, um, all the panelists, if you can turn your Cameron, I have some questions for you uh, based a little bit on what we've talked about before and the conversation that we've been having. So um, I also have some audience questions, so hopefully we can get to those and we'll have about 30 minutes to chat. So hopefully, you know, that's, we can get to some juicy uh, conversations. So first question I have, um, so this is like more a question like, and you all have mentioned this, but uh, since Colette got, went first, she didn't get a chance to address this, but I would like to thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And I would like to know from what you've heard from the other speakers, what is something that you found to be really striking or interesting? So what is something that you, that you heard from someone else that was speaking that, that really like um, got your attention? So uh, it's pretty, pretty free. If anyone wants to go first, feel free to. Um, well, I'll just say, um, I just sent both the minister and Pato my little chat, like um, just, I'm just feeling very proud to be black right now with these types of leaders from across the, the globe. So just wanted to take a minute to say that it is, um, this is a lonely space sometimes. And many of us are, as the minister just said, sometimes the only black faces in these climate rooms. And um, just to be here with, uh, with other black leaders on climate is just, is something I'm taking away. So another um, round of gratitude um, for this panel. I think um, when Patu, uh, there's a lot that that really hit me. Um, we feel the invisibility, right? So when Ida hit the Gulf Coast, it was one thing, but when it went up to New York, it was as though the, you know, um, it, it's always interesting to see what gets the coverage, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to hear Patu say, you know, we're not, we're watching Germany, but we're not watching Uganda. We're watching, you know, we're watching these Western nations, but we're not watching what's happening in these, in these other places that, that, so that was really uh, resonant with me. But I think the biggest part was, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the consequences of the Africa and what's going to happen, but you're not telling the story of Africa. That, that really was, uh, that hit me um, deeply because I think we have to do a better job of not just pointing to, and I feel like I'm guilty of that as well, like not pointing to just the victimization that climate change will cause, but what, what are the stories that Africa has to tell itself? 
Um, so that for me, that was really powerful. I think when the minister mentioned um, 80% of the biodiversity in indigenous communities, you know, we always hear that, right? We, we hear that statistic, but we don't really think about what minister said about <laughs> how many of these indigenous communities are black, how much of the Amazon indigenous communities are of African descent. Um, because there is this sort of exotification of indigeneity right now that leaves out the blackness. And that is um, that really uh, resonated for me. So I'm just really grateful. Um, I, I wrote down lots of lots of things, by the way, but those are the two things that really kind of hit my soul. Well, thank you for sharing, Colette. Um, anyone else have anything they wanted to share uh, on this point? Um, I'm happy to go next. Um, I think I'm also just really happy to be in this space where it's we're engaging in a mutual respect way and it's meaningful engagement and it's not um, how can we help you and pose for the camera and but what was really sad that stood out for me across um, both what the minister and Colette said was how global the environmental, the racism is within environment. Um, collect where you're from, you were sidelined because it mostly affected black people. Um, when the minister spoke, um, when we talk about the, 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 when we talk about the Amazon and everything, we talk, we, we never talk about the black people. Um, the indigenous people are usually the black people and we just, the erasure of black people is global. We're raising them in Africa. If CNN is gonna come here and talk about a climate solution, they are going to find the three white men in Botswana to speak to. We've got like no white people in Botswana, <laughs> but they will find them. Um, and then the, the other thing was how, because of like the intersectionality, once again, of um, black people and class and income, Globally, once again, we're still the worst affected. Um, and it, it's something that I know, but it's still really sad to have it confirmed. And yeah, that was it from my end. Well, not it, but like those are the only two things that I'll highlight from my end. Thank you, Pato. Um, and Minister, did you have anything you wanted to share about? Uh, I mean, I know you talked a lot about what they said before, but was there anything else that you felt um, you wanted to share about what Pato and Colette talked about? Well, I, I really changed what I, I wanted to say at the beginning of my presentation because I was so impressed um, by what, what, what Colette and, and Pato said. And uh, Colette, obviously, when, when you, were, you were talking, I was connecting with what Black people are facing just right now with with flooding in Chocó or in the Pacific coast of Colombia, or, uh, or, or, or just what, uh, let's, say, let's say this, the last extreme event, the hurricanes in, 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 the, in the Caribbean, uh, they hit black communities in Latin America. Most of them in Colombia was San Andres in Providencia, particularly Providencia, and they erased those communities. And, Disconnect what, what, what Coletta said at how these communities are by, by themselves because there is not much help. And I'm telling, being somebody who was in, inside the government uh, 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 before, and it connects with Pato said in terms of how those reports and news from Latin America never mention not the context, the word the word Afro-descendant or black, but you see the images and the people that are affected, but they're not mentioning us. So it's like, we're at a story. So, so that is a tremendous problem that we have and how we can connect with this. Something that we really need to do is, uh, the United States have a lot of uh, uh, power in terms of getting out stories. And there are a lot of Afro-descending people here that are in the media. But my perception is that they are not questioning this kind of report for areas that they know that there are black people that they are not presenting our stories. So, of, of suffering and also of possibility for solutions. So that really impacted me of what 
uh, Colette and Pato said, uh, and, 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 this, uh, and they're interconnected. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, I have another question, but if anyone would like to follow up on that, because I would like to be more of a free flowing conversation. If anyone wants to follow up on that, please do. If not, I do have another, like some more questions. Um, so the next question, and this has come up with, um, I think, and with, with multiple speakers about how we're often left out of the conversation. Uh, we aren't brought to the table a lot. And um, there's another, this is sort of going about how we are all part of this diaspora. Um, and, and, all, and everyone, in, uh, everyone in our part of the diaspora is not treated well, but it's not really brought up to the, it's not talked about. So I wanted to know with, um, with COP26 coming up uh, in a couple of months, yeah, it's all, it's all, it's already, yeesh, it's almost November, but uh, with COP26 coming up and the way that these sort of talks and events um, are spoken about in terms of like only these nation state frameworks, is it possible to get to like escape that framework of these country boundaries when dealing with the climate crisis? Because we can say the climate crisis is affecting Americans in a certain way, but we all know all Americans are not affected the same way by the climate crisis. There are differences. So um, yeah, is there a way to think about COP26 or alternatively, do you have any thoughts about how that those con these convenings happen and what kind of conversations need to be happening um, in terms of being equitable and just? Um, I'm happy to go first. So I think with these um, with these kind of convenings, I do think we need we need to participate in them um, because it shows political will. And there's very little that will get done if we don't have political will. Um, but on the bright side, it doesn't mean that without COP we won't have action. I think we saw this in California, where even though um, Trump pulled you, <laughs> it pulled you out of COP. Um, California was still quite progressive um, with some of with some of its things. So it doesn't necessarily stop action, but it is easier to do it within. Even in Botswana, we have NDC. We had we submitted our first NDCs, I think, in 2015, but we only got a, a, a climate policy um, this year in 2021. And then in terms of equitable engagement, um, there was re not recently, maybe two weeks ago, Climate Action Network called for the postponement of COP26 um, because it would not, it was not inclusive um, of the global south and looking at things like having to quarantine and just vaccine racism and um, poverty, if we can look at, if we can call it, that, well, it's really vaccine racism, let's call it what it is. Um, a lot of the global south wouldn't be able to attend. And from the plans that the UK was talking about, it did not sound like um, they would happen in time. So I think calls like that need to be taken heed of. Um, when we talk about when we talk about postponing it so that we're more inclusive and we're like, no, you know what, money has already been spent, so let's go forward. The danger with that is we are then normalizing having, well, it's already normal, but we're further normalizing having conversations about the global South, about African lives, about um, South, um, South, South American lives and, um, the, and the people of those areas without them in the room. There are decisions that are going to be made about them when they're not there. And by COP doing that, they're then putting a stamp of approval of such a conduct. So I think in as much as yes, uh, COP has invested a lot in this and it's been uh, a year, possibly what well, it's been, yeah, almost two years without a COP meeting. I think we shouldn't have it for the sake of having it. We need um, SDGs. They're both under the same umbrella of United nations, we keep talking about leave no one behind. This is the time to show that leave no one behind is not just a tagline. So I think COP needs to go back to the whole thing of leave no one behind. Are we not leaving anyone behind? Fixing that. And if they can fix that, go forward with COP. That's it from me. Um, yeah, I, I uh, 
A thousand percent agree. Uh, we signed on as the US Climate Action Network into that global call and the Movement for Black Lives also signed on to that call, standing in solidarity with the, with the Global South and just thinking about the minister's words around connection, exchange and solidarity and that solidarity, I believe uh, Anna mentioned was rooted in love. You know, it's really the love of our people that if the, if the Global South is calling a foul, the rest of us have to call the foul um, or else we will continue to, um, as Patu said, normalize what is discrimination and exclusion. Um, again, at the UN, at the UN no less. Um, which is, I mean, if our if our international peace body is excluding the global, so we are in trouble. Um, if this is where we are, and the question is a is a really good one: Is there a way to think about this globally as not just nation states? I mean, I I think there there has to be some practical um, understanding of the role of nation states. The the U.S. Um, in particular has a a role that cannot be skirted and must be accounted for on that what we are doing to the planet, our, our consumption, um, the laws that drive our consumption, um, the political um, engines and, and the corporate um, engines behind our consumption, this, this has to be accounted for as a nation state. And I think it's important that we do that. Um, and I'm, you know, if you put a, a legal hat on this, this we, we, there's liability here and there's damage and we have to be able to, to pay out those remedies um, and I think they come in the form of climate reparations. But, but the question asks, can we think about this outside of nation states? And I think the United Nations already has many, many um, vehicles to think outside of the nation statehood. They, there are rights treaties, um, global treaties on the rights of indigenous people. Um, there is the, the, the working group on the people of African descent. Why not address this climate crisis with those frameworks? And I think it's because there really is a lack of innovation. You know, the truth is, and I tell regular Black folks this all the time who are new to the climate conversation, like you, you, can, you can see that nobody really knows what to do because of how chaotic all of, the, all, of the, all of the things are. And you can see how big this is. This issue is not an issue like criminal justice or education or health. This is the issue that is, is, is going through a lot of, um, of, of the social issues. So how do we think about the intersectionality of, of people? How do we think about the, um, the, the nation they live in, the, the race they come from, the gender they hold, the ability that they carry? How do we think intersectionally about these solutions? Because if we continue to do all of the things that we have done, then we will get everything that we have right now. It's time to be not just innovative, but courageously so to reimagine how we engage around global, um, global agreements. I think Patu's bringing up California, even in the incident of President Trump pulling the US out of the climate, uh, out of the Paris Agreement, it's actually a really good one. Uh, how, you know, it, capital has already proven to us that borders don't exist, let's be clear. I mean, I know we keep treating people like borders exist, but money has proven that borders do not. And if that's the case, and states and communities are able to make advances on a global agreement, then why not push that? And where is the climate movement's um, real innovation around a ground up movement for climate justice, which is not the same thing as a just a nation state top down um, sort of acknowledgement uh, of, of, of climate action. I think there's some opportunity here, um, but the IPCC report reminds us we're running out of time. And the time that we're running out of usually leads us into a very colonized sense of urgency around how we must get to this answer. And so we'll cut out these people, we'll leave out this analysis and we'll, and we'll move past this issue. But the truth is what we're saying is it's time to deal with all of this now because we will not get to solutions that can withstand a new climate reality if we don't have the courage and ability to sort of deal with the hard stuff now. Uh, um, well, I, I, I will say that uh, obviously we, we need to look at, at this uh, challenge and also the way to respond to it um, beyond our country boundaries. And we are making an effort uh, here at, at ESI at MIT and with Pratt, with Juan Camilo and others to look at the climate and environmental uh, solution based on community-driven and nature-driven uh, 
from a more hemispheric perspective. Because I will just give you one example of Colombia. The same families that live in Providencia, which is Colombia, in one side of in the insular Caribbean, are the same family that are uh, in Nicaragua, in the continental Caribbean. The same, I'm talking about black families, Afro-descendant families. The same families that you have in one side of the Darien in Panama are the same families that are in the other side of the Darien in Colombia, in Chocó, where I come from. So there is no way that we, we, we need to have that, to look at the issue of that scale. We are, we have the same challenges based on the history of colonialism and slavery, but we are not talking to each other. We are not talking with each other. We don't have platform as Pato said to talk about it. And, and uh, I, uh, as, as Colette said, we need to impact collectively as, as, as Afro-descendant and African people, the climate movement, which is very white, very European, European centric. And to do that, we need to have first exchange information and knowledge of what, what it is doing. Second, we need to uh, uh, create uh, at least platforms to set our own agenda. One example of this, and part of was mentioning, and I have I was in those discussions. I participated as minister in some COP, some COP that they were, were done. It's like this discussion about adaptation and mitigation. First, when you look at the scale of Af African diaspora, you see that we are not the big emitters of the world. That's not we not we didn't uh, create this problem, but we are facing the consequences. So there is a huge issue of uh, differential of power and inequality. So it's like, it's like, oh, you want to talk about mitigation? Do your work. Do your work. Don't emit. To the contrary, we are sequestrating what you are emitting with the Congo Basin, with the Amazon Basin, with the wetlands in Louisiana do your work and then compensate us. That's our agenda. Our agenda is adaptation and financing. But they are putting us the, the agenda of just mitigation, just mitigation without having this conversation. They will not have this conversation if we are not there. Putting the issue on the table, we need to be there. But from a, from a a uh, Pan-African perspective. We are trying to do that. We are, we are going to have, and I invite the, the two of you to a conversation that we, with some, some uh, uh, leaders from the US and Latin America, we want to have in the COP26 in Glasgow. Just Afro-descending people, but I think part of that we need to expand this to African people too. We were thinking just about the, the Western hemisphere, but I think that we need to do that and I, I, I'm, I'm inviting the three of you and I will send the invitation because we need to have this conversation and having the power that listening to us. But to do that, we need to connect each other. So we are proposing to have, with Juan Camilo, we are working on this, to have a network of community innovators because they don't have the credential of being PhD for MIT or whatever, but they are innovating. To have also, uh, community leaders that are making the difference, like, like, like Colette knows a lot of them in Louisiana, with, and they don't have the necessary the recognition. And also young Afro-descendant and African scientists. They write and they are doing research, but they don't have the platform to the world list, to read and to, 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 to know those, those research. So that's what that we are working on in the project that we have. And I, I really invite all of you to be part of it. And, and by the way, I will formalize this invitation to the dialogue that we are going to have in Glasgow. Um, may I just add something onto what the minister just said, Mike? Yeah, of course. Um, on the financing, um, 
I think something else that we need to focus, that we need to think about when it comes to the financing, the global north and the big emitters can't be the ones who are driving the conversation of financing and how they're going to bring us the finances after they are the ones who did the harm. When we look at financing, we need to look at loss and damage, financing for loss and damage, because there's a lot of loss and damage that's already been done across the um, the African continent. This oil spills, um, even in um, some um, South America, all of these things need to be accounted for. And then the second thing with the finance, they can't then come and dictate that this finance needs to be loans, um, even if it's if they say interest-free loans, these need to be grants. You can't then say we're going to help you um, and then put Africa, African countries or global southern countries further in debt. What? So I think those are also two conversations that need to add that go under the um the umbrella of financing for climate. Oh yeah, that's that is a great point. I think. Um, globally, like there needs to be some repair. There should be reparations to these communities who have who have suffered the most. Um, and it, like you said, it should be a grant. It should be money with no attachments. It shouldn't be a loan because I think that creates a system where you're basically put into like peonage, and you're constantly having to owe back more and more money, and you can never get out of it. It just keeps putting you into a hole. So yes, thank you. That's a really important point, um, Pato. Uh, so it looks like you've answered a lot of the audience questions, actually. Um, but um, I, I think we may have time for one or two more questions. Um, I was, yeah, I think uh, we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but maybe this is, I'll try to combine these because the minister brought this up a little bit. But, you know, all of us are from... I really want to know how can we support each other across these geographies, these cultures and languages. We are part of the diaspora, but as the minister said, we there are differences in our in, in our histories. Um, we share a common history, but they've branched out. Uh, but I would like to know, I really want to know, um, you know, we even have different levels of privilege, honestly. Uh, and like, how can we overcome that to make sure that we are working towards progress for all of our brothers and sisters? Um, across the diaspora and really across the world, because we are we we exist in the world. We're we're just as important as anyone else. But how can we, um, you know, within our diaspora, what do you think we can do to support each other? Um, and how can we ask people that are watching this um, to support the efforts of the work you're doing? Okay, I'll go first, seeing as I'm already unmuted and everyone else is still muted. Um, I'll start with how we can support each other to work together. Um, and then I will also go into how you can support my work. So I think the best way that we can support each other and work together is to be inclusive. So when the minister is in a room, ask where is the African in this room? Where are the African women? Where are the young people? Colette as well, when you're in the room, where, um, where are the people from Colombia? Where are the um, people from the Amazon? We're talking about them. Where are people from, from Africa? When, we are, when I'm in a room, I'll ask if I'm talking to Americans, where are the black people? Where are the black women? Where are the black men? Um, where are the people from the from South America? I think by always just checking, where are your people in the room? Where are your people in the conversation? And then another thing is as we, in as much as we've got our similarities, you highlighted this, Mike, in as much as we've got our similarities, we've also got our differences. So um, in Africa, we've got a challenge where people will bring solutions from other parts of the country and then they'll come here and they'll fail because of maladaptation. And then we will say, no, clearly the community-based organizations that we're trying to work with, they are the problem. That's why the solution failed. Your solution failed, um, but the people you're trying to help with the solution are the problem. Um, so with that, I think we also need to tailor whatever we do to that different region or the different group. When you're working with community-based organizations in Africa, they're notoriously terribly, um, terribly funded. How do you ensure that in virtual meetings like this, they are present? 
um, and they don't have to choose between buying data and buying food or buying whatever other necessity. Um, and even at academic levels, when you're talking, when you're when you're when we're citing all of these studies, we should read each other. When I'm talking, when I want to know about um, communicating climate change, how do we do it in Africa? How do we do, how do we do it in Botswana, in Nigeria, in Colombia? What are they saying, Colette? What are the black people who have a different culture in America saying? Let's consume each other. Let's read um, black. Let's follow black people um, on our social media and so forth. Because now you know um, you can monetize that and amplify it. Let's cite them in our academia. Let's watch them on your YouTube channel. If you need to know something, try and find a black person whose content um, you can consume um, and then support them. And then how you can support my work. Um, like I said, I mostly, I, I host the Sustain 267 podcast, which is focused on amplifying African voices, solutions and experiences within climate change. So you can listen to the podcast. Um, I'll share its name in the chat just now. So you can listen to the podcast or you can become a patron. So um, my podcast is not funded at all because I didn't want to be at risk of a funder telling me what to do. So I chose to go the Patreon model. You can support for as little as $3 per month. I would highly appreciate it. And that's how you can support Africans and me. That's it from me. Thank you, Pato. Yeah, I, I, I can go now. Um, uh, first, I, I was, uh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Coletta and, and Pato are, are, are fantastic. I, I, I enjoy really this conversation and, and, and we could connect very easily. Um, I, I think we are implementing a project that we call the, uh, uh, we call environmental equity and racial racial justice in the Amazon and the Afro descent, the natural belt of the Americas. So the invitation is first, uh, if you are in your countries, is just to get more information about uh, Afro descendant people, black people in the Americas, and the connection with climate, climate and environment from our perspective. The, the second is to advocate for us because we need like many people saying what Pato said is, where are black people Afro descendant in what you are talking about here? Uh, and, and the other one is, hey, if you are rich, you still can write a check because we need some funding. It's like in Louisiana, people need funding. In, in Choco, people need funding in Colombia. Uh, in Honduras, our people need funding. Uh, uh, in the Congo Basin, people need funding. In Botswana, need funding. In South Africa, need funding. So, uh, yeah, we we need to. You see this. Uh, uh, yesterday, I was in a, a, a in a meeting, and they announced that Jeff Bezos is giving Colombia one uh, one billion for climate change. And I said, Oh, that's good, but our people will not see it. So it's like we need uh, after sending people also to have their platform, philanthropists to support our causes. Well, I, I certainly <laughs> just laughing at the Bezos thing. Like, that's great. A billion dollars, we'll never see it. I feel like that every time the US does something, it's like, that's great. Billions of dollars, black folks will never see that. You know, like, what is this and why is this so easily? Um, why do we know this so clearly about all of our countries? Um, I, um, I, I think about how we can support each other. And I, you know, um, I'm looking forward to talking with both Minister Luis and Pato after this, because we were also planning an all black social at, at COP. Um, our, so I think we can put our, put our events together and see, and see who we bring. And we were absolutely um, just thinking about anybody who identifies as Black in this climate work, um, not even because we have a good analysis of your reality, but because we know what it is to be Black in this climate work. And it is, it, we need our voices together. Um, and I think about, um, uh, and I'll put in the chat in just a second, we're working with the Movement for Black Lives um, to 
uh, reach 8.8 .8 million Black folks in the U.S. just to get them to understand that climate impacts Black lives the same way policing does and the criminal justice system. This is a big issue, and it's not just for white environmentalists. It's for us. It's our issue. We have to engage. And we've begun a Red, Black, and Green New Deal initiative to honor the Red, Black, and Green flag um, that, that many African descent um, Americans have to have to fly because we don't know where we come from because of the legacy of slavery, um, but also to connect with a movement around a Green New Deal or at least deep federal investment in, in uh, a shifting and changing around how we get ready for this new reality. Um, I'll also just mention that I think, you know, how folks can, can show up for us is, um, you know, nobody's granting us anything. Let's be clear about where the money came from in the first place. Um, and I and I was just thinking about, you know, um, everything that we're stealing from Africa, everything that we've stolen from from these these indigenous spaces, the Amazon, these forests. And we have the nerve to think we're doing something good by donating. You better get on Patu's podcast. You better write that check to Columbia. It's the least you could do if you're listening and consuming this information. It can't just be for your own growth. There's got to be some forward motion here. And, and I think if nothing else, getting behind black leadership in this moment, where as the minister said so beautifully, these, these black and indigenous communities have been maintaining the earth in a balanced way. We're not the problem. Um, and so if you want this solution to actually uh, scale up and, and save not just us, but you, um, it would be, um, I think, the most prudent thing to get behind the black leadership that we see. And I just wanna offer my thanks again to the new school and to into this conversation because there are a million solutionaries out there. We don't have access to the education as the minister said. There are a million ideas out here. We don't get to take risks or we get held, you know, um, bound by grants as, as Patu mentioned. We don't have the freedom to even innovate, dream and reimagine because of our blackness. And I think the advocacy has to continue to be for racial justice across the globe. It has to be around anti-colonialism and against anti-white supremacy across the globe. And it, it ha we have to take on, I'm sorry to say, I hope no one falls out of their chair, but we're gonna have to take on this economic system called capitalism. It is at the root of, this, of these issues. It is at the root of taking people out of a continent, relegating them to something less than human, using their labor and making money off of that. And it is that same extraction process that we're seeing with fossil fuels. It is that same extraction process that we're seeing with immigrant labor. This is a philosophy of extraction that is rooted in capitalism that we have to tackle. And we're gonna need not just black folks coming up with those solutions, we're gonna need everyone. Thank you, that's- um, Can I just say, am I the only one not going to cop? Like once again, the African is not in the party, but okay, okay. I mean, I don't think I'm going either, but you know, uh, but yeah, it, that is that's that is an issue. That's a great point that you brought up. Um, yeah, like vaccine racism. It's it's yeah, that's it's terrible. But um, I'd like to, on that note, I, I really would like to thank all of you all for taking the time to speak to us. This was a really great conversation. I feel like we could have kept going for another hour, um, but I really appreciate uh, having the chance to just talk about. Black people, talk with Black people about these issues that are affecting us across the globe and really getting to learn more about um, what's going on, where, where you're from or where you live and how we can support each other. Because I think that's the most important thing that we can support each other um, because a lot of the time no one else will. So um, I really appreciate this. Uh, I wanted to make a couple of announcements before we go. Um, so uh, our, the Right for Creative Disruption and Environmental Justice Movement Fellowship application closes on September 26 at 11.59 uh, Pacific time. Please make sure your groups are finishing up their applications uh, because we know coordinating takes time. Uh, please check that out and go uh, visit the Tishman Center website at tishmancenter.org slash fellowship for more information. Um, yeah, and the group applications are closing. And the other, um, the other announcement I wanted to make was that we have some, a lot more Climate Week events coming up. This was our first one. So I'm really glad I got to share this with our speakers and with you all that are in the audience. So tonight we're gonna have Hoodwinked in the Hot House, uh, which is looking at 
addressing false solutions. Uh, and then tomorrow we're gonna, our, um, our colleagues at the Urban Systems Lab are hosting the, the Resilient Urban Futures book launch. Uh, and I think that's gonna be a great conversation as well. The Tishman Center will be holding an open house on Thursday. So if you are a new school student, staff, faculty, or just interested about the work that we do, you can join that. And we have a couple other events uh, on our Climate Week page. And you can go to that uh, looking, uh, if you look at the slide, new school, event.newschool.edu slash Climate Week Hub. Again, I wanna thank all of our speakers. You all were really fantastic. And I wanna thank all of you for listening. And yeah, I hope everyone has a nice rest of your day uh, and thank you.